So the first package that is uh, not represented today is the Trelinos solver package out of Sandia National Laboratory. Trelinos is a very large, sophisticated C++ based um, library with a great deal of capabilities. The particular capabilities that we're mentioning today in the slides are associated with areas that um, FastMath is focusing on currently. There are other areas that um, you should look at uh, that we won't be talking about today. So first of all is the Trelinos nonlinear solvers. They, of course, have traditional Newton-based solvers. But in addition, they have what's called uh, Anderson acceleration. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this this afternoon. It's becoming increasingly important that the goal of us people who want to solve non-linear -PD, non PDEs is actually to put Jim Demel out of business. We want to actually, as much as possible, not require the use of linear algebra and tackle more directly the nonlinear problems. And Anderson acceleration is a particular technique to do that. We're starting to develop suites of software in portable libraries to do that, much as we have in the past done that for linear solvers. So going beyond just the Newton-based solvers. Uh, in addition, um, Trelino has, has very good support for trust region methods and homotopy methods. So the reason for this thing here is you should not be writing your own Newton's method. If you write your own Newton's method, you'll generally won't do the line searches as well or as sophisticated as what you might need for your problem, nor would you implement the homotopy methods correctly for your problem. So it's much better to do a library, even though naively you think a Newton's method's a three-line method. Why don't I just code that myself? It'll be easier. Uh, here's a, a block diagram of the various pieces of, um, of Trelinos. So you can certainly go and look for uh, a lot of information on the web about it. Um, one part I'll point out is they have a lot of uh, support for sensitivity analysis, stability analysis, and so forth that is really more or less only contained in Trilino. Some other packages do not provide such a sophisticated level of support as they do. Uh, they included a slide showing some performance benefits of using backtracking with Newton and homotopy methods versus just trying to use straight Newton and not getting convergence for this particular problem. Uh, in addition, Trelinos also has an algebraic multigrid uh, method implementation called ML. Uh, ML's also a pretty good, pretty good method. It's nice to have both of them in your, uh, your suite of, of methods. And again, some pictures of some of the problems they've been able to use the ML on, quite, quite complicated problems. The uh, second package is a package called Parpack, which is, uh, or maybe Parpack, which is an eigenvalue package for computing a small number of eigenvalues for very large problems, generally sparse, so they don't actually always have to be sparse. Um, it's available from the website indicated here, and um, it can compute either extreme eigenvalues at either end or uh, a set of eigenvalues somewhere in the, in the middle of the spectrum. It provides both uh, MPI version and OpenMP implementations. And it's actually available in MATLAB if you use the eigs function in MATLAB. It actually calls uh, a version of Parapack. Currently under FastMath, they've been using um, Parapack for these uh, nuclear configuration interaction calculations. Um, and pulling out what they need from the Krylov subspaces. So those are the three package that we're not going to uh, have a large tutorial presentation on. We're just making a very short introduction to. Okay. If anyone would like to ask very few general questions, feel free to do that now. Otherwise, uh... are all of these packages commercial packages? Or are they so the fast math packages are all open source in one form or another. Uh, most of them are pretty generous open source. That is, they could be used in, in commercial packages or not. The community is just beginning to try to introduce commercial versions of the packages. Um, some, the DOE, when it develops these packages, it generally develops them for specific purposes, and it doesn't spend a lot of time making them as general purpose as people would like. So the Department of Energy is putting a little money into helping commercial companies develop versions that are a bit more robust, that are very easy to install, that are a bit easier to use, 
and make those available for commercial companies to use or students or, or anybody. But in general, the philosophy of Department of Energy with regard to the math library is to make them all open source and something that anybody can download and install. And because the Department of Energy uses such a variety of machines, we're really focused on portability. So we won't provide a piece of software that only runs under Windows, for example. Almost always it'll run under a large number of different kinds of machines because that's what we need. Commercial companies will tend to provide it for one particular system. So uh, this is uh, not so related to the packages themselves, but I'm just curious, can you explain a little bit how this fast map uh, Institute works like in terms of organizing because I've noticed there are people from different institutions and what is exactly the, the structure and how it works. Um, this might be actually maybe Yeah, maybe Laurie Laurie would want to say something about that. And I would first start by saying that it works because of Laurie, and then she can go into the detail. <laughs> so I am definitely looking for the question because I was in the back and I couldn't hear you. Yeah, it's mostly about how is this stuff organized, the fast map. Because I've noticed people from different institutions, and how do you guys get together? Like, how do you collaborate? How do you choose the institutions that you work with? And uh... so, so for so SIDAC, as I mentioned earlier, has been around for um, 13 years now. In the first two rounds of SIDAC, there were three applied math projects each round that focused on individually block structured grid methods, unstructured grid methods, and, and solution of linear nonlinear systems. So, to some extent. Um, uh, in the early days, um, there were many proposals that, that were um, put forward, and those were the three that were selected. Um, in this round of, of SIDAC, one of the uh, guidance areas that, that we got from, from the Department of Energy was they wanted to see a more integrated center. And so we took, uh, we proposed um, a proposal that built on the previous three centers, and that was selected for funding. Now, how does it actually, so that's, that's how this came to be. Um, uh, how it actually works, right? <laughs> so, so there's a long history, um, I think, of the block structured grid team working together, the unstructured grid team working together, and the linear solvers folks working together through the previous um, versions of SIDAC. What we've been trying to really push on this time is more of that interaction across the disciplines. And so the mesh solver interactions, we've got a, a large number of, of interactions that are driven primarily by application needs um, that are driving what we need to do with our software. Uh, we've been also pushing hard on understanding best practices. For example, you know, how, how do we want to use MPI plus threads? What are the experiences across the center and how can we leverage that, that expertise that's been developing? In fact, in early October, we're planning another workshop in, at Argonne to start looking at heterogeneous nodes and what, what lessons have people learned so far in their experiment with that and are there things that we should be doing together to tackle that. Things like this tutorial have been excellent motivating um, cross-institutional activities from the perspective of our software and trying to lower the adoptions, uh, the barriers to adoption of our software. So does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. So you basically put a layer on top of several uh, uh, different programs, more or less. More or less. I would, yeah, because, uh, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, that all, almost all of our investigators have lots of things that they do. And so, um, getting getting mind share to get them to participate in a larger group activity, um, you know that that can be a challenge, right? And we're ge geographically distributed across the country, and that also is a challenge, right? Just from the perspective of getting every, getting everybody together is expensive. You know, it costs you know eighty to one hundred k to get the whole team together for a two to three day meeting, and so you know we want to pick and choose, you know when and how we do that and for what purposes we do that. So it's, it's a challenging endeavor because it is such a large institute. I could say a little more at the technical level with regard to actual technical work that goes on. Even the, quote, individual teams are actually distributed. So, for example, the PETC team is not everybody co-located in the same set of cubicles. So all the different teams, if you talk to them, you'll see they all use a distributed revision control systems like Git and so forth, a lot of email, of course, telephone conferences, chats on Google, um, Google Plus, and so forth, to, to do that communication even at the small level. And then we're trying to do it, you know, of course, between the different 
between the different groups. And generally, each of the subgroup teams have a smaller number of people who are also collaborating directly with uh, another subgroup. And so they're aware of both sides in, in great detail. So an example of that is Mark Adams, who we'll talk tomorrow, who's a member of both the Petsy team and the Chambo team. He's not a side member of the Chambo team or the Petsy team. He's a full-fledged member of both teams and understands the aspects between those and is a great conduit for how we need to communicate between those. And we need people like that in order to actually get this kind of collaboration. So it's really hierarchical where, where membership is not a, exclusive you know, to one group or inclusive to only one group. And increasingly, we need to do that communication with computer scientists as well, right, as we're tackling the challenges of the next generation architectures and programming models, you know, are, are changing and coming online and debugging techniques and, you know, all those things that I mentioned as challenges, you know, it's not only within the math community, it's across math and computer science as well. Because yeah. these are issues that most of you will be facing in your careers of working in, in distributed teams uh, across e even different countries. And, um, and so what, you know, what Barry was describing, people who happen to be bridging are often the most important ingredient. But then there are also you know, software techniques uh, and, and tools that will help a lot.